Hey team, all right, so we are moving on. We're gonna jump into the tetrapods. Um, so we're still in phylum chordata. We're still talking about vertebrates. We're talking about nathostomes. Now we're talking about nathostomes that have true limbs with digits. Okay, so we're gonna moving into the first group we're talking about these amphibians, but all of these organisms right here, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, we all call them tetrapods. Okay, what that means, tetra, tetra means four, and pod means foot, right? So these are organisms that have four feet. Specifically, we're talking about organisms that have four feet with limbs with digits. And these are the vertebrates that are able to live on land, okay? <clears throat> so if we recall from where we ended up last time, with, within the bony fish, we talked about the lobe fin fishes. Okay, so again, these were living in typically um, shallow coastal areas, um, where that really murky water would have been warm and it would have been really low in oxygen content. So these organisms had lungs, so they could still they could exchange gas with their lungs. Some also had gills. Okay? Um, and they were using those those muscular lobed um, appendages of their pelvic fins and their pectoral fins to lift themselves up and stick their head up out of the water. So that way they could use their lungs to exchange gases. Okay, they could even walk kind of wiggle back and forth from one kind of coastal pond to another. Um, <clears throat> and it's certain lineages of these lobe finned fish that end up being um, the sister taxa and sharing a common ancestor with the tetrapods that we have around today. Okay? Um, and over time, these, these lobe fins of this group became more and more true limb-like and they started to develop digits. So kind of what this looks like. This is our hypothesis of what this, of what this looks like. Um, early lobe fin fish had just enough of a little bit of a nub almost, a little bit of a limb to kind of push themselves up. Um, but over time, they sort of um, evolution kind of tinkered with it, natural selection and mutations rose, rose up, and that limb structure started to develop so that way they could lift themselves up even more and start to actually walk. Okay. So the reason why these limbs are so significant is because moving on land is a lot more efficient if you have these limbs that you can move that allow you to propel yourself. Okay. So it allows for muscle attach attachment that allows the force of pushing against the ground to be transferred to the rest of the body. Okay. So these lobe fin fish, one population of them split off and then started to develop much more significant limb-like structures and especially limbs with digits. That's, that's one of the important parts, not just limbs, but limbs with digits. Okay. And the fossil that we found that we think would have been the sister taxa or this, we share a common ancestor with the common ancestor of the rest of tetrapods. This is Acanthostega. Um, this is what we think it looks like, some of the pieces that we found. I mean, it was one of the first ones to have, see these rays of digits, and we can start to see the development of some of the, the bones that we have in our limbs as well. Okay, so this is kind of the beginnings of these limbs that could support their weight on land, and they have these digits that start to replace those pectoral and those pelvic fins. So vertebrates moving onto land. Moving in land is a lot different than moving in water. So that just like we talked about in plants, you have to fight against that force of gravity in order to stay upright. The same thing is true of vertebrates that are starting to, to transition onto land. Okay, so we've already have some animals that are on land at this point. Arthropods were the first ones to be on land. They could survive because they had those jointed paired appendages, right? Um, because these vertebrates are taking a different evolutionary trajectory, they settle on a very similar idea of having these limbs that are jointed. But they, life on land not only resulted in, the, in these jointed limbs, these four limbs, um, a few other things arose as well. So we see um, the pelvic girdle, where those pelvic fins or those pelvic limbs are coming out, it has now been fused to the backbone. Okay? So think about your, your pelvic girdle, your hip bones, right? basically where your legs come out of, that is all fused together to your backbone. So that way, the force that's exerted by those hind legs um, can be used to move the rest of the body. Okay, so if it wasn't fused, that pelvic girl would basically just kind of sink onto the ground, right? And the back end would kind of be dragged along while the legs are just kind of flopping out behind it. 
Um, so that fusion of the pelvic girdle to the legs allowed them to keep their, the back end of the animal up off of the ground for more efficient movement. Um, we also see extra vertebra. We start to see the evolution of extra vertebra to separate the head from the rest of the body, basically creating these, these neck vertebra right here, the cervical vertebra. Um, and why that's useful is because if you're on land, you need to be able to move your head from side to side to see what's going on, or maybe up and down, okay? But if, if your head is fused to the rest of your body, you'd have to move your entire body to see what's going on around you. And that's incredibly inefficient, especially if your legs are meant to stay on the ground, um, so that way you can move and keep propelling yourself. It's um, a huge adaptation to be able to move your head separate from the rest of your body. Um, gills are no longer used, so gills are efficient for exchanging gases and water. Um, but now that these tetrapods are living on land, there's no, they're not using their gills. So we see the gills um, take on a new function. So the gills, those pharyngeal slits, the pharyngeal clefts that um, derive into gills in, in aquatic species, they now start to make up parts of the inner, e inner ear as well as some other endocrine glands as well. Okay, but they're lost and they're no longer functioning for gas exchange. Instead, we have the lungs, which is derived from the swim bladder, um, from the lobed fish, that's, that's allowing for gas exchange. Okay. And now, also, remember in the sharks and the, the bony fish, they have that lateral line that runs the entire length of their body, that they can detect changes in water pressure. That process of det detecting changes in pressure, well, now it's air pressure instead of water pressure, but that process of detecting changes in air pressure is now going to be used by these external ears, or pinnae. Okay, so these external structures are ears. This is something that's unique to land vertebrates that allow us to detect changes in the uh, air pressure of the air around us. Okay. Um, and we're going to see as we continue on through these different land vertebrates, through these tetrapods, we're going to see some different alterations of this basic plan. For example, in, um, in birds, they, their pectoral limbs, their, what would be our arms, our front limbs, have um, become adapted for flight. Right? But it's the same basic idea that they now have limbs, these tetrapods now have limbs that allow them to exist on land. So the first um, group of two tetrapods that we want to talk about are the amphibians. So that name amphibios, amphibian, means dual life. Okay? So that means that this group, they're spending part of their life, usually, in water and part of their life on land. Um, so these amphibians, these were the first tetrapods, the first vertebrates that we know of that were able to walk on land, but they're still very much tied to water, um, not only for, for reproduction, um, many of them also spend their early life stages in, in water as well. Um, and even if they may not be living in water, they typically require moist or very humid habitats because they're still using their skin to exchange gases. Okay. Their lungs are not very efficient because they're lacking a diaphragm, which means that they do not have the ability to inflate their lungs in the way that we do. So they continue to exchange gases um, through their skin. And in order for gas exchange to happen, this is the same thing, same thing with the lining of our lungs. In order for gas exchange to happen, that medium, that exchange surface has to be wet. Okay? So even if they are living in dry environments, like there are some desert toads, they have to keep their skin wet in some way, so that way they can exchange gases. Um, so this is also some, the first group that we start to see two-way blood circulation. So we only saw a single loop circulation in the fish. We start to see two-way blood circulation. So that means it's going to go from the lungs to the heart, out to the tissues, um, and then back to the, back to the heart. And then either, well, to the lungs, to the heart, to the tissues, um, or to the skin and exchange gases, and then back to the heart. Okay, so we have that two-way circulation. Um, and their heart it actually has a partially divided heart. Um, that means there isn't a complete division between the regions of the heart where they have oxygenated blood coming in and deoxygenated blood, excuse me, oxygenated blood coming out and deoxygenated blood coming in. So there is a little bit of mixing of that oxygenated blood and that deoxygenated blood. But it's not a huge deal because their um, metabolism is pretty low. Um, so they don't have necessarily the same oxygen requirement that um, other organisms have because these are ectothermic organisms. They do not maintain their own body temperature. So the main groups that we have of the amphibians are the um, urodella, the salamanders. So that name means with tails. Okay? Um, 
These typically do not go through dramatic metamorphosis like we see in the frogs. They tend they tend to look the same in their in their early stages, the juvenile stages, as they do as adults. So they retain their tails. Um, so these include the salamanders and newts, um, many of which are poisonous, um, but not all. Um, the other group of amphibians, Anura, um, these are the frogs, um, and toads would be in this group as well. Basically, the only difference between a frog and toad is that toads have thicker, leathery skin um, compared to a frog. Um, and this group does go through um, a, that metamorphosis, that transition, um, where their larval stages or their younger juvenile stages are aquatic. Um, the tadpole stage, they retain their gills, they have a tail. And then they go through that transition um, where they move on to land, where they um, have their legs, that are, those really strong back legs that allow them to jump, and to move around. And they don't know how many gills, but they require on their lungs, right? And typically in their larval stages and their tadpole stage, they are going to be herbivorous or maybe eating small um, invertebrates in the water. But in their adult stage, they're carnivorous. Okay. And then this third group down here, the apoda, that means legless or without legs, the Sicilians. Um, these are amphibians. For, I know they look like annelids, they look like segmented dwarves, but they are truly amphibians. Um, similar to how snakes and the reptiles lost their legs, um, same thing happened here. They've secondarily lost their limbs. Um, these are pretty rare species. They tend to be um, burrowing species, so they live kind of similar as an earthworm would, um, and they're typically going to be eating small invertebrates and things that are in the, that are in the soil with them. Okay, so one thing that we do want to highlight about amphibians is we see that they still have external fertilization and they have to return to water. Most species of amphibians have to return to water um, in order to reproduce. So that really limits the environments that they can exist in. So just like we saw in plants, the mosses and ferns still require water for their gametes to fuse, so do amphibians. Um, so they're limited to areas in which they can find fresh water to reproduce because what happens is um, during mating, the female is going to secrete her eggs into the water and then the male um, is mounted right on top of her and secretes his sperm right on top of the eggs as well. And so if those eggs are ever out of water, they desiccate and they shrivel up. Okay, so they're, this um, process of their eggs having to be laid in water as well as their skin having to remain moist for gas exchange really, really limits the extent of the environments that they can live in, the different types of habitats they can live in. Um, so when they do lay eggs, they lay huge amounts of them, either in water or sometimes in moist or muddy soil. Um, and many of their eggs are going to die. They're going to have a really high mortality. And so when they lay tons and tons of them, hundreds or thousands of them in times in these clumps right here. Um, Amphibians are incredibly endangered. Over the past 30 years, it's estimated that at least 100 species have gone extinct, um, potentially even more. There could be some that have gone extinct that we haven't even had a chance to identify yet. Um, and this is driven, there's multiple factors that are kind of all intersecting together to create this, this major issue for these amphibians. Um, it's a combination of loss of habitat, um, global warming, um, Pollution. Amphibians are really sensitive to pollution, especially water pollution, because they, um, their skin has to remain moist, and these are pollutants that are in that water that they're in can irritate their skin and cause damage to it. And then tied in with global warming and habitat degradation and increased contact potentially with humans is the spread of a fungal pathogen called chytrid fungus um, that is going to that can infect their skin, and then. They basically create extra layers of skin to try and fight off this fungus, but the more layers of skin that they create, that minimizes the amount of gas that they can exchange. Okay. Um, so oftentimes amphibians, the presence of amphibians and how diverse the amphibian group is in an ecosystem can give us a sense as to how um, well intact the ecosystem is and its functionality. Okay. Oh, so that is the amphibians, and we'll start off in just a minute with the amniotes, with the reptiles.